Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Unisoft Law Professional Corporation YouTube show. We're back on air. I am interviewing uh, different professionals, mostly lawyers. And uh, uh, the purpose of these interviews is to highlight the range of talent we have in the city. My last interview was with Anna Malajavaya, a tax lawyer, and criminal liability under Income Tax Act came up criminal liability for tax evasion. And I thought it would be a great idea to bring a criminal lawyer to this show. And uh, what a criminal lawyer I have for you here today, a fantastic lawyer. His name is Lawrence Graydon. He is with uh, Browdy Thorning LLP. Without further ado, I will uh, pass the floor to Lawrence and let him introduce himself. Good morning, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, so as you said, I, I am a principally a criminal lawyer. Um, I've been practicing for approximately 10 years uh, in criminal law. I also do quite a lot of professional discipline work, which, which overlaps uh, quite a lot with the criminal work. Um, and my practice is a little bit different, I think, from uh, what people might think of as sort of a typical criminal lawyer uh, in that uh, I don't deal with a lot of sort of street crime or robberies and uh, things of that nature. Principally, my work uh, revolves around representing professionals when they find themselves in conflict with the uh, with criminal law or with their regulator, um, and that includes doctors, lawyers, uh, pr a lot of police officers. Uh, I represent when they find themselves uh, in trouble or or uh, subject to an oversight investigation. Um, so that's a little bit different. I also do quite a lot of work with uh, with corporate clients. Um, I represent for people. Uh, Fortune 500 company on uh, advising them on uh, compliance with Canadian law enforcement. Um, so that's sort of different than I think what most people think of is, uh, you know, when they think of the typical criminal lawyer. Um, and also recently I've been doing quite a lot of policy work as well, um, helping to, uh, to lobby for uh, particular legislation or uh, making recommendations to government uh, with respect to legislation. Uh, I was recently before the uh, Ontario uh, Standing Committee on Justice Policy on a particular bill, uh, which was quite exciting. So I'm doing quite a bit of that work as well. So criminal, uh, you know, in my sense, is, is very quite an expansive field and doesn't just involve like, what I think people uh, you know, typically as sort of the street crime, representing um, people charged with street crimes and things of that nature. Interesting. Uh, to me, criminal law is surrounded by a kind of mystique. And I'm guessing uh, it's also uh, a so for uh, many other lawyers, especially litigators. And my theory is that there's a singular reason uh, for this mystique, especially in the, in, the case of, uh, in the case of other litigators. It's the uh, uh, sheer number of trials that criminal lawyers do. And of course, uh, it's common knowledge in, among civil litigators that trials are rare in civil litigation. I'm a commercial litigator, I'm a civil litigator, and I've done a, a few trials, but uh, let's say one trial a year is, is really good for me, right? If I do one trial a year. So uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, trials and criminal law. And I wanted to dispel that mystique a little bit, although I know that lawyers like to, uh, to maintain mystique around their practices. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think our video, our interview will be watched by other lawyers. So um, they are sophisticated and uh, we want to uh, educate them about criminal law practice. Uh, so first of all, how often do you do trials? <laughs> So it's going to vary uh, quite a bit from one criminal lawyer to another, right? Uh, as, you, yeah. as you point out. Um, in order to dispel that mystique a little bit, um, you know, in, in civil litigation, obviously, most cases are able to be resolved and settled. Um, there's lots of reasons for that, including the fact that it's just so costly to litigate. Um, the reality is, and people may not appreciate this, but that's the same is true in criminal law the vast, vast majority of cases do end up resolving in some fashion that does not involve a, a trial. Uh, the typical statistics are around 98% resolve. 
Um, you know, I think in civil litigation, it's, you know, perhaps 99% or, or perhaps even higher than that. But we do see a very, very high resolution rate uh, in criminal law as well. Um, that being said, there are very different dynamics. So we do see a number of uh, cases coming to trial that wouldn't necessarily come to trial if it was a, a similar piece of civil litigation. Um, so, so I would say it's true that criminal lawyers do more trials than civil litigators, again, depending on their, their nature of their practice. Um, but uh, it's not like every case goes to trial. There's a lot of resolution that, that's happening. Um, particularly for people who do legal aid work in criminal law, uh, they tend to have a, a higher volume of trials. Uh, the kind of work that I do, it's interesting. My cases, um, uh, my clients typically can't resolve their cases with a guilty plea. It's simply not an option to them. Um, the vast majority of my clients have no criminal record and a criminal record would be essentially professionally a death sentence for them. Um, so it's just not an option. So Obviously, I look at ways of resolving their cases, and I'm frequently successful in resolving their cases in a way that doesn't involve any kind of admission of guilt and doesn't involve a plea. Uh, but a lot of my cases still do resolve. Um, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's sort of part of the facts of it. But I think in, in uh, where people have uh, do a lot more legal aid work or more street crime, you do see quite a bit more trials. Uh, they tend to have more volume practices. Um, I do do quite a bit of uh, administrative hearings as well. Uh, so I, I'm, in the, I'm in the tribunals a fair bit, probably more frequently than I am in terms of criminal trials. Um. I see. Uh, so here, here's a question. And uh, before I ask this question, I want to propose a theory of a criminal trial. I've never done one. So uh, forgive me if it sounds silly to you. But I did uh, uh, civil trials and civil, especially in commercial litigation, civil trials are uh, document intensive. They're usually about a relationship. So let's, let's say two biggest uh, issues in commercial litigation are breach of contract or negligence, right? And uh, uh, both suggest some kind of relationship. So you're looking at the history of the relationship, you're looking at the background of the parties, uh, you're looking at potentially uh, experts to uh, quantify damages, right? There are no damages in criminal law. Uh, my guess is that a lot of uh, situations that give rise to criminal charges, especially uh, in street crime, as you said, are discreet and uh, fairly narrow. And I'm also um, thinking from my time in... Uh, uh, law school that criminal offenses are fairly straightforwardly uh, defined and that it's almost uh, uh, perhaps it is a charter requirement that criminal offenses are unambiguous and that the tests are very clear and uh, are uh, essentially codified in the criminal code. No, now in uh, uh, commercial litigation for example Sometimes there is a dispute as to what the, uh, the test actually is because one court said something and another court said something else. So there are serious legal issues uh, and legal ambiguity in commercial litigation and factual situations are complex. So my theory about um, criminal law trials is that they're often on a narrow factual issue and the law is crystal clear. Uh, very often. Is this theory, theory completely stupid or there is some uh, truth? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's certainly not stupid. Um, you're right that, you know, we have the advantage of having uh, the elements of, you know, the, the criminal offenses are set out in a statutory code and the criminal code or various pieces of provincial re regulations. But um, just because they're set out in statute doesn't mean that those statute are, statutes aren't subject to interpretation. There's still uh, you know, quite a lot of common law that goes into uh, the contours of those offenses, the contours of the elements of each offense. Uh, and just to highlight an example for you, uh, very recently the Supreme Court of Canada dealt with you know, what, is the, what is the mental element um, for breaching your bail? Um, you know, and, and that's been an offense that's been on the books for, I don't know how long, but, you know, decades and decades and decades. And it's only now that the Supreme Court of Canada is finally resolving that issue because different courts were going different ways on, uh, on what the mental elements are. So, and that's true of, of you know, really any offense. We, we see cases going up to the Supreme Court of Canada where contours are being constantly shifted and set. 
Um, our courts of appeal disagree across the country on what the elements are. Um, so, you know, even though it's set out in a statute and it seems like it might be simple, uh, the reality is you know quite a bit of law and you do have to follow the cases because, uh, because you know, those boundaries and those definitions are constantly shifting. You know, what is a firearm? You know, what constitutes a firearm? That's another case that recently, you know, a few years ago, went up to the Court of Appeal. Um, you know, so... And how about I, I, I uh, would Chan and Sullivan? I'm sorry? Uh, how about Chan and Sal Sullivan recently in the Court of Appeal, automatism? Exactly. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, sexual assault and, um, you know, there's, I mean, I, I have some concerns about how that's, that case has been sort of portrayed in the media, but, uh, you know, we're dealing with sort of the boundaries of when a person is doing something voluntarily and when they're not doing something voluntarily and when that can serve as a defense uh, to a criminal offense. Um, and again, th those things, I mean, th the thing about that is that it's something that comes up so rarely that we don't really encounter it a lot in criminal law, that sort of level of automatism, it's, it's quite rare. Uh, but as I said, you know, even with common issues, um, like breach of bail and what the mental element is for breach of bail, which comes up all the time, uh, we still get guidance from our, uh, from our courts that shift our definitions and how we approach these cases on a constant basis. What about factual situations? Are they usually discrete or uh, is, it, is it common to have complex uh, factual matrices? Usually I would say that the, the vast, vast majority of cases coming before the courts are fairly narrow. So I think you're quite, quite on point about that. Um, but there are exceptions as well. There are uh, cases that are you know, forensically complex, particularly homicides tend to be forensically complex. Um, we have fraud cases, especially complex frauds. Those can be very, very document heavy and you could right. you, it require the assistance of experts. Um, you know, we have uh, another, in terms of on the street crime level, we have what are called major projects. Uh, and those can be, um, you know, a, a gang investigation or a, an organized crime investigation that spans many, many accused, that's based on conspiracies, that's based on wiretaps, uh, you know, search warrants, those can be also very quite document heavy. Um, and, and the relationships between people can be very, very complex. Those are rare, though, the, the vast, vast majority of cases coming before the courts are very, as you said, very discreet, very narrow issues. And oftentimes, uh, those issues, um, uh, you know, the legal issues are well settled, oftentimes. Uh, speaking of legal issues, is admissibility of evidence frequently argued uh, in criminal trials? Absolutely. Um, I would say probably the, the number one most important skill for uh, a criminal lawyer is to, ha is to have a very, very solid foundation in the law of evidence. Um, a lot of cases are going to turn on the admissibility of evidence. Um, and, you know, we're talking not only common law evidentiary rules, but also constitutional rules relating to the admissibility of evidence and breaches of the charter, right? Because if, if uh, the police breached or the state breaches a person's charter rights in obtaining that evidence that can be a basis for exclusion of that evidence and the entire case can fall apart I mean if the uh, if we're talking about an impaired driving case where the breath sample was taken illegally um, the entire case is likely to fall apart if that evidence gets excluded if we're talking about a drug case where the drugs were seized illegally it's very likely that the entire case is going to fall fall apart so a lot of times uh, criminal lawyers are actually strictly dealing the entire case is all about is this one piece of evidence going to be admissible or not and if the piece of evidence is admissible my client may as well plead guilty because you know uh they're done like dinner uh and, and you know conversely if uh if the evidence is inadmissible my client walks scot-free so certainly uh, admissibility of evidence i think is like one of the forefront issues that criminal lawyers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis Lawrence, uh, I just had an idea. Will you let me observe one of your criminal trials? I want to claim uh, CPD credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. That's great. I don't know when I, we're going to have members of the public observing uh, criminal trials again anytime right. in the future, but uh, that would be quite fun. Yes. Um, interesting. So, of course, um, I want to, uh, if I go back to comparing criminal and civil litigation, uh, if the role of trials is huge in criminal litigation, the role of motion practice and discovery is huge 
in uh, civil and commercial litigation, what is the uh, uh, comparative place of motion practice and discovery, if, if any, in criminal litigation? It's a great question. So uh, you might be surprised to know that we really don't have a discovery system in criminal law. Uh, what we have is disclosure, which means that the prosecution is required to provide us with essentially a copy of all the evidence that they've gathered in the, in the case. Um, so we have, you know, witness statements and things like that. But in terms of actually putting a witness up to discover them, we don't get an opportunity to do that. Um, we did up until recently for people who are charged with indictable offenses, the more serious offenses, we did have the ability to have a preliminary inquiry. Um, and a preliminary inquiry is like a mini trial to determine whether there's enough evidence uh, to put a person on trial. And during that preliminary inquiry process, you would get an opportunity to call witnesses or hear from witnesses um, as part of that. So those served an important discovery function because you could get a witness under oath. You have their statement in advance and you can cross-examine them on that statement. You can lock them down on, uh, on their version of events. Um, however, there's been a recent push, as you might be aware of, to eliminate preliminary inquiries um, because they were considered, for, for various reasons really, um, uh, they were considered sort of time consuming. They could potentially re-traumatize a victim if they have to testify both at a preliminary inquiry and at a trial. Uh, other reasons as well. But um, that push has, uh, has really, really limited the number of opportunities we have to have a preliminary inquiry. And I would say probably in the vast majority of cases that go to trial, um, there is no preliminary inquiry. Uh, there is no opportunity to discover witnesses before they, they hit the box. Um, and that might come as, uh, as quite a shock to civil litigators. Um, you know, we essentially have to go on whatever statement the police gathered and, and very frequently the police are not asking the kinds of questions that we would like to be asking the witnesses. Um, so, so we're at a bit of a disadvantage in that respect. And certainly the, the elimination of the preliminary inquiry for most cases um, has widened that disadvantage for the defense. You know, one of the powerful tools uh, in the toolkit of criminal litigators is the charter, of course. And uh, when you told me about preliminary inquiries, I, uh, I wanted to ask you if the courts have ever considered whether depriving the accused, in certain cases at least, of preliminary inquiry uh, um, infringes on uh, their charter rights. Great question. The answer is no. They, they, do not, they do not consider it to be an infringement of charter rights. Uh, uh, there was obviously a strong push on the part of the defense bar to protect the preliminary inquiry at all costs. Um, and there has been litigation um, on that issue. Uh, and unfortunately, the courts have ruled that you, know, you essentially don't have a constitutional right to a preliminary inquiry. So um, it's been you know, sliced and diced and gradually uh, eliminated. So it does remain in certain cases for the most, most serious offenses, you still have the right to a preliminary inquiry, but it's very, very rare uh, that you'd be dealing with one of those kinds of cases. In eliminating preliminary inquiries, how important was the policy argument uh, in favor of protecting witnesses and victims of crime? Um, I think that was one of the, the key reasons why uh, the government sought to eliminate them. They, they wanted to uh, protect witnesses from having to testify twice, uh, which can, of course, be traumatic. You know, if you think of partic in particular sexual assaults, right? Uh, having the, the complainant or the victim in a sexual assault uh, testify and be cross-examined in full, uh, rather probing cross-examination at a preliminary inquiry uh, can be painful for them. Um, and then uh, to have that have to happen again at the trial uh, just, just sort of re-traumatizes the person. Um, so that I think was one of the significant arguments for eliminating the preliminary inquiry. I should point out though that um, there are and have for a long time been measures that were put in place to protect witnesses in those kinds of situations. Um, the criminal code has a number of procedures available for, uh, for a person to, for example, testify behind a screen so that they don't have to uh, you know, come face to face and, and actually see the, the uh, person that they've accused of, of, you know, seriously harming them. Um, that's just one example, but there are numerous protections, potential protections in place. Uh, I guess it was felt that those were not sufficient and, uh, and the push has been to essentially eliminate the preliminary inquiry almost entirely. When, when you talk about 
these issues, I, I can't help um, thinking about um, your your earlier statement that you were not quite happy with the public um, with the media coverage of the uh, uh, dual cases Chan and Sullivan in the Ontario Court of Appeal or the Ontario Court of Appeal decision in those cases. Would you spend a couple of minutes telling uh, our audience about these cases, what the Court of Appeal found and what you didn't like about the media coverage? Yeah, so I, I'm not an expert in those cases. As I don't, uh, as I said, we don't, we don't really deal with those kinds of levels of autonomous, uh, automatism on a regular basis. They come up quite rarely. So, uh, but in general, the, the uh, view in the media was that the Ontario Court of Appeal has essentially established that if you're drunk, you can get away with anything, including you can get away with sexual assault. Um, and that has never been the case, and that is not the case with respect to what uh, uh, Chan and Sullivan decided. Um, we're talking about a very, very narrow decision that applies in very rare circumstances where a person is um, essentially so intoxicated. We're not just talking about um, you know, drunk. We're talking about a person who is so intoxicated that there's essentially expert medical evidence that they are no longer in, con they're, they're no longer in control of their functions, that they are uh, no longer in control of their behaviors. They're almost in like a, a trance state. They're what we call automatons. Um, they're not acting voluntarily. And in those circumstances, uh, uh, essentially what the court said is that a person has a right to raise that as a potential defense. Doesn't mean it's going to succeed. Um, it's just that uh, the criminal code for constitutional reasons cannot prohibit a person from raising in their defense the fact that they, they weren't acting voluntarily. You know, to give you an example, if a person has a, um, a person has a medical issue, has a seizure, and in the course of seizing, they strike another person, uh, that person's not guilty of a criminal offense. They didn't have control of their actions. They didn't make a choice to strike the other person. Uh, you know, if a person has a medical issue behind the wheel and crashes the car, uh, you know, unforeseen medical issue, you know, we typically don't hold that person criminally responsible for that conduct because it wasn't voluntary. This just extends that to, uh, to whether it applies in a case where a person through uh, ingestion of some kind of substance can get into that kind of a state where they're no longer acting voluntarily, should they have the right to be able to even raise that as a defense? Uh, and the answer is yes, they, they do have the right to raise that as a defense. It's, you know, uh, the constitution essentially prohibits the, the government from eliminating that entirely as a defense. And that's really what the case was about. It's going to come up uh, virtually never. Uh, you know, you need an enormous amount of medical evidence to establish that you are at that level of, uh, of uh, automatism. Uh, so, you know, to, to the, the media pushing this narrative that, you know, it's now a, a defense to simply say you were drunk, uh, it's a defense to a sexual assault, is just false. It's not true. Um, and it's frankly scaremongering. Um, you know, I think it's, it's quite unfortunate. There is a complex philosophical argument behind uh, this case. And this argument uh, is about where moral blameworthiness begins. And, um, I guess those people in the media that misinterpreted, misrepresented uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal decision, it seems to me they were taking a position um, of philosophical nature, essentially saying your mor moral blameworthiness begins when you uh, take uh, the illegal drug or drink, and then uh, essentially you assume the risk of criminal liability for anything that happens thereafter, uh, while our legal tradition is rooted in this concept that moral blameworthiness begins when you know what you're doing, right? And, and this is my, of course, informed layperson's view. I also had an A plus in legal philosophy in law school just to use this opportunity <laughs> to brag. But do you think it makes sense? Um, this, 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 this description. Yeah, I think you. I think you have it exactly right. I think that that's exactly where the uh, where the struggle, the legal struggle, you know, was about. It was uh, it was about where exactly do we draw the line uh, for culpability? When does conduct become criminal? Um, 
you know, it's open to the government to just prohibit, you know, the excessive consumption of alcohol, right? They could just say, make it a criminal offense to have a certain blood alcohol content, period. Um, but what they did here was essentially to hold you responsible for things that you no longer have voluntary control of, um, you know, after you've made the decision to drink, which is not criminal, which is not prohibited. Um, you know, and I think in one of the factual circumstances, and you'd have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of them was, uh, you know, one of the gentlemen was trying to commit suicide and had taken a large number of, uh, ingested a large quantity of drugs and basically kill himself and um, survived that and went on to do things in this automatistic state that he would never otherwise want to do, you know. Um, that's just an example, right? But right. I mean, again, it's, it's open to the government to criminalize uh, the consumption of illegal drugs if they wanted to. They can, they can criminalize having a certain blood alcohol content uh, if they want to do that. But in terms of making you criminally liable for things that you do after the fact, that's where the court um, decided to draw the line. Criminal law appears to be a complex um, web of uh, philosophy, um, legal arguments and, and facts. And uh, on that background, of course, criminal law attracts a lot more attention from the public than, let's say, civil litigation or commercial litigation for that matter. So the combination of these two things, sheer complexity and huge public interest, in my view, makes criminal law the most misunderstood area of law. Uh, as far as lay people are concerned. Would you say that this is your perception as well? You know, I think that criminal law is probably just simply the most visible kind of law. Um, you know, when people think of law, I mean, most of the time what they're thinking of is a code of laws that exists to, you know, constrain behavior. Um, and that's really criminal law that they're, that they're thinking of and talking about, right? Going back to like Hammurabi's code, you know, a, a system of uh, principles and rules that govern uh, how we interact with one another. So that's kind of, I think, the most visible. Um, and, you know, also obviously the fact that the cases just get media attention because they tend to be sexy. You know, when we're talking about uh, things that are um, salacious, things that are, you know, violent events, uh, things that cause public outrage when they happen uh, just tends to capture the imagination more so than a, you know a contractual dispute that frankly could actually be just as interesting i mean you know the uber case was was i think quite interesting recently um you know so and those obviously also involve the application of legal philosophy and legal theory uh, in much the same way that criminal law does i just think that it's it's not quite as sexy i think to the public mm -hmm. um so I, I ultimately agree with your point that i think criminal law is most misunderstood, and that's only because criminal law is, is the most uh, uh, sort of captures the imagination of the public more. Uh, if civil law was was, or if a civil law case was quite sexy, I think it would also be equally misunderstood by members of the public. Actually, a great example, if you remember the McDonald's litigation, right? Yeah. The the personal injury litigation against McDonald's, where a person spilled hot coffee on themselves. Yeah. Um, you know that case is has been mis quoted, uh, misinterpreted, um, you know, and that's just because it, it got so much attention. Um, right. I think the, the public capacity to, to misunderstand the law is, is quite great, regardless of yes. what area you're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not limiting my comments to the public. I'm limiting, you know, it certainly applies to lawyers as well. I have, right. I'm sure I misinterpret, you know, uh, cases that I come across that are not in my field. Lawrence, you worked on some of the probably most some of the most high profile criminal cases in Canada. What advice can you uh, uh, give to uh, lawyers on dealing with the media? Um, be very, very careful what you say to the media. Um, you know, obviously you need to get instructions from your client if you're going to speak to the media at all. Uh, you need to make sure that you're, if you are going to speak to them, um, that you're comments are consistent with your obligations to that client, your duty of loyalty. Uh, so there are significant ethical considerations in terms of dealing with the media. Um, and I think that in general, um, it, it's usually better to avoid it. 
there's a number of risks that are present, including your words being taken out of context, your words being edited down, um, that you might not be thinking of, you know, uh, when you're giving a particular statement to the media. So there's always a concern there. So generally, I would say, you know, uh, it's better to exercise a lot of caution before you do it. Um, you know, we also have to be aware that sometimes, no matter what we say, we're not going to be able to get the public on side with our uh, with our client. Um, you know, people who deal with criminal law often have clients that are vilified, um, and so a lawyer coming out and saying, you know, um, positive things about their clients is probably not going to change a lot of minds. And the question then becomes, is it really worth to have having that discussion? Usually, you know, in criminal law, it's better to simply say, my client's looking forward to their day in court. Uh, you know, we hope that this, uh, this trial is going to reveal all the issues and, and uh, you know, uh, the truth is going to come out. Something along those lines without getting into the evidence, without getting into, you know, personal details, things of that nature is generally the, the safest approach. I see. But before we wrap up uh, today, Lawrence, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about criminal lawyers' lifestyle. This is also a part of this perhaps misconception that other lawyers have about uh, the life of a criminal lawyer. So the idea is you guys wake up uh, from, uh, with, you know, from phone calls from the jail in the middle of the night. You have to uh, spend a lot of time in correctional facilities. There is a lot of urgency in your work, a lot of urgent proceedings. Uh, the stakes are incredibly high because it's always liberty, right? It's not money usually. Um, so could you comment on those points? Uh, I would say that most of what you said is probably true, um, especially for the vast majority of criminal lawyers who are sort of dealing with a day-to-day uh, -day representing people accused of crimes, people who have been arrested. Uh, you know, my work is, is a little bit different, so it sort of changes my work-life balance a little bit. But uh, certainly there are times when I get calls in the middle of the night or I have an urgent bail hearing that I need to do because a client has just been arrested. Um, so, you know, you're on essentially 24 seven. There are a lot of urgent issues. And as you said, the stakes are very high because, um, you know, it's it can be, you know, a person's liberty. It can be a person's career that's at stake. You know, a person who's arrested and finds themselves uh, detained uh, instead of getting bail is almost certainly going to lose their job during that process, uh, is going to have their life turned upside down, even though they have not been found guilty of any kind of crime. Um, and so, you know, we're always thinking about that and it's, a, it's quite an enormous responsibility, um, but it's also what makes the job quite exciting. I see. Well, Lawrence, I want to thank you personally and on behalf of our viewers for this incredible interview. I personally learned a lot and uh, I'm really thankful for the access that I have to uh, highly competent experts like you. It's, it's, it's an incredible privilege that I can sit down with you and you would give me uh, your valuable time and share this uh, insightful uh, information and analysis. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all the best in your practice. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And, uh, and, and I consider it a privilege to know you. So thank you very much. Thank you.